<laughs> Recording in progress. Okay, so welcome. I'm glad that all of you are here. I'm shocked by how many of you are there are, and I'm excited and nervous about that because this is probably the riskiest class I've ever taught. <laughs> and so um, if you if you get mad, remember you chose this. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, right, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, this, so as you can see, the, this is the book that we're talking about tonight. So Faith After Doubt, uh, this, the subtitle of this is Why Your Beliefs Stopped Working and What to Do About It. So you can, if you've read any of the other books, you're going to see the similarity in that topic. And um, it's, they are often, if you put either one of these books in a checkout at like Amazon, it's going to say, do you want to buy the other one that everyone else buys with that? So that's why I want to present the first because it does provide some helpful context um, to this class uh, that we're going to be doing. Before we get deeply into any of that, though, I just think it's really important at the outset of this class to say that, especially for the first few weeks, like our hardest two weeks, I think, are going to be next week and the week after, because those are the two weeks that we're going to focus on all the reasons to say no to the question, do I stay Christian, right? So those are going to be most likely for our audience the most upsetting, right? And uh, if you've read the introduction, he even sort of warns about that, right? And, and has some direction about how you could read this book in a different order and all that. So feel free to take any of that guidance from him about maybe reading some other parts if you need to or whatever. Um, uh, and um, the biggest thing that I want us to sort of commit to, though, in this class is to letting us have permission, because the whole thing is worthless if we don't, to really step into the doubt that we're going to be talking about and the questions that we're going to be talking about. And so what that's going to look like from all of us in terms of making an agreement with each other is that we're not quick to do apologetics. And so if you, if you don't know what apologetics is, that's defending the faith. So when somebody expresses a doubt or a concern about Christianity, what I don't want to do is have somebody else in the class quickly tell them why their doubt is not valid or that there's a good reason that they shouldn't have that doubt, right? It's very common in Christianity that when people do that in a Bible class, that's, a, that's the first thing we, we sort of want to do. And I want us to all pull back from that and to say, I totally get that instead. And maybe affirm the fact that there are some real reasons why a person might not want to be Christian anymore. Is, oh, the door is open. I think they just realized. Um, that's probably Margaret and, uh, and Kat. Yes. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, welcome. Um, so just making sure that, that that my biggest request of you is just to not try to fix people, even though you might want to out of love, right? A lot of times that is, that desire to want to say those things is to encourage someone or help them. And you may ask for that, right? You may say, I'm really struggling with this. Do any of you, have any of you worked through it? Then we'll help you, right? But if you're not asking us to help you, I want to not provide help that isn't asked for. Is that fair? Okay. Um, so with that, let's start with a quick prayer, and then we're going to dive right in. Uh, Spirit, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to come together and to do that from all the different places that all of us are. Uh, those who come tonight strong in, the, in their season of faith, those who come with deep questions about faith, those whose faith is great, but their, their sort of trust in Christianity is broken, all the different places that we can be, that we come with all that tonight to be exactly where we are honestly and uh, to be open and vulnerable and share about that and begin this journey of exploring what does that mean for us in our spiritual lives. Uh, bless our conversation tonight. May it, may it be uh, mind-opening, world-opening, and will, may also help us in our in our day to day interactions with others as we seek to um, be the the best uh, possible version of ourselves to be the representations of Christ in the world. For your many names, Amen. So one of the things that he talks about in this book that is going to be one of the, the frameworks that I'm going to teach from because I'm still the pastor of this church, right? <laughs> is that Jesus is fine 
right? In the, in the conversations of both of these books, it's not really Jesus that's the problem. Christianity is the problem. Mm -hmm. So through this whole class, that's going to be one thing you're going to kind of hopefully hear from me is that I'm not really questioning Jesus, right? The book's not ever really going to question Jesus, but it is going to question the Christianity that has come up since Christ, okay? Uh, so if we, be, we begin with uh, this quote from the life of Pi, uh, I want to make sure that's a little bit more in the frame. That's too far for you to read, isn't it, Melanie? Yeah. I'm going to send these this slide deck out as well, so and, and the video from tonight. So if you're watching later, you might want to have the slide deck open as well. So this says, uh, The Life of Pi, if you don't know, is a book that was made into a movie. And it said, if Christ spent an anguish night in prayer, if he burst out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then surely we are also permitted doubt. But we must move on. To, to, to choose doubt as a philosophy of, uh, of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. So the argument of this that's going to be supported through this book is that doubt is not a place we can stay. But doubt is a place that moves us. Okay, mm -hmm. the whole point of the life of Pi, the book itself, is that um, is is an argument that um, oh, now I've lost the word. Not atheism, but the one that means you don't uh, that that agnosticism is not a reasonable stance when it comes right down to it. Because in the end, you're gonna even if you say you're agnostic, you're gonna have to make choices, right? Um, I'm ruining the book for you, sorry. Our class, <laughs> there's a beautiful story about a tiger in there too, though. Uh, the class goals are tonight to learn and be able to identify the four stages of faith from faith after doubt. And hopefully in this process, as we dialogue, I want you to talk to me tonight. It's gonna be really boring for you and a pain for me if it's just a one-way conversation, is that you'll also be able to start to go, oh, that's my parents or, oh, that's my brother, or, oh, that's my friend, that you start to be able to not only rec not only be able to identify them or know what they are, but identify them in others and yourself, okay? And then throughout the class, we'll discuss and explore all the chapters of Do I Stay Christian? I already kind of said we're going to share openly our doubts and questions and try not to fix each other you know, along the way. So the four stages of faith. Um, in this book, McLaren lays out what he says are sort of... Um, if you think about, uh, if you've ever taken like a childhood development type class that sort of talks about the stages of growth of, of, of a person, he does that as the stages of faith we go through. And the four stages are simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. And so we're going to walk through simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony in order tonight and sort of st stopping as we go, talking as we go to uh, see if we make sure that we understand those four different stages. They correlate to the places in which you're going to start to ask the questions of the book, Do I Stay Christian? So that's where the tie-in is, is that the transitions between these stages are the places where the questions of the second book are going to arise. Uh, an important thing when we're dealing with stages, and Brian goes through a lot of effort to make sure that this is clear in the first book, is that he doesn't want you to see the stages as sort of a, um, oh, here's a chance for you to figure out how, how, how high on, on the ladder of these stages you are so you can look down on everybody else. It is absolutely not that kind of model. He uses a quote from Thomas Keating saying, ladders and stages suggest leaving behind the previous runner stage but actually one adds new dimensions to what one is, like a tree adds rings. And so the model in the book looks like this, of concentric circles for each stage. And so the important part of this is that every stage contains and builds upon the previous stage. So just because you're in stage two, for instance, you contain all the makings for stage one, two. So you can revert, or you can just get into a bad place in your life and sort of start to act out of that stage two, stage one that's still in you, and some of the things that you learn to do better than, but you've you, the, the situation you're in is pushing you back there, okay? That'll be more clear as we go along. I think you'll start to think of examples in your own life or other people's lives 
but every stage is still in you. You're just adding a new ring as you go through a crisis that leads you to a new stage. So stage one simplicity is marked by developing our mental ability to, uh, in, to separate into dualistic categories. So um, I know that's a lot of fancy words, but dualism is the one word of that, right? So in a very simple way, is this edible or inedible, right? Survival in the wild originally, can I eat that mushroom or can I not eat that mushroom? Is this person a friend or an enemy? right? Teaching our kids, stranger danger, being able to assess as we're older quickly, is someone safe or is someone unsafe? We're walking down the street at night, trying to make those, some, those decisions, permitted or prohibited. And these are, these are important um, divisions to be able to learn, right? So no stage is bad. This is important grounding that we all need to learn to be able to suss out these types of things. Um, you know, I think about a kid we're trying to teach about sharing. Is it, is it okay to, to steal a toy from my friend? Or do I, is, that, is that a permitted thing or a prohibited thing? And we're gonna you know, slap the kid's hand when they try to take the toy away from the friend. Maybe we don't slap the kid's hand anymore, but whatever you do, I'm not a parent. <laughs> I'm glad that's on tape. I just recorded myself saying beat children. That'll come back. Thanks so much for that political career I was planning. Um, and then in a, in, a, in a more adult version, because we can get stuck here, even as adults, is telling a lie or using violence, a clever and effective way to get what you want, Donald Trump. Wow. I mean, this we're going, we're going there. He goes there in the first, in the introduction. So we're going there too. <laughs> So is telling a lie or using violence a clever and effective way to get what you want, or is that a punishable offense? We hope it's very punishable. Well, and it's it's a huge point. I mean, it really this is a huge point. We are wrestling with this on a on a on a national level right now. Is there going to be accountability or not? And what does it teach to our children if there isn't? Right. So this this even though it's stage one in its simplicity. It has big ramifications in the world, even on the scale as big as the president. Yeah, yeah. they're older women. Uh huh. I was reading this today. It occurred to me that Donald Trump is nearly, nearly the latest incarnation that this has been kept underground over so long in the government, and now it's coming out. Your great stage three will get there later. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> it's going to be so fun. Uh, so this ability in, in simplicity to be able to make these dualistic determinations of good or bad, like the simplest version is, is it good or bad, right or wrong, good or bad. This is something that is taught to us by the big people. Right? And there's all kinds of big people in our lives. We've got parents and grandparents and teachers and preachers and uh, just all sorts of people, as, especially as we're kids growing up, who are being those big people teaching us the, those rules and how, it, how to play this game, so to speak. And these people are central in our lives in stage one because they are the ones who show us the rules and they are also the ones who are going to enforce those rules. Critically, they're going to play both of those roles. And so if we were to talk about sort of the, the nature of stage one, stage one is the stage of author, authority, authority and dualism. So if you put that into a political category, um, that means stage one is a um, authoritarian and dualistic society. This slide's very weird. My screen is going super dark. I don't know how to fix that. It's because it's trying to look at the screen and look at the TV. Um, and so that there, that's, that's, again, another place where this is going to run up against not just church, but also politics. <laughs> right? the, in church, that there is authoritarian and dualistic church as well. Right. This is the kind of church that you go to where if the pastor says that this is what we believe, this is what we believe. End of discussion. Don't question it, right? We probably, some of us may have come from a, a uh, religious tradition like that. Anybody? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
I, I like the concept of the teacher is also the enforcer. Yes. Like, it, and oftentimes that's um, self-declared. Yep. Yeah, there, and then there can be some real problems that come from the teacher and the enforcer being the same person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in faith, we can turn that into that God is also those things. So that when we read the Bible, that is the uh, that is the teaching, and that God is also going to then come and be the enforcer of that teaching, right? I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because we get to that a little bit in a second, but all of this is supposed to be built on trust because in the right version of stage one, those teachers and enforcers are doing this for our betterment, right? This is the parent who teaches you to look both ways before you cross the road, and when you don't, they yell at you for that, right? Because they are trying to keep you from walking out in front of a bus and getting killed, right? So in its, in its purest form, it's built on trust and that everybody understands it's for the, for the good. Uh, let me just give an example of that. Uh, simple trust, so yeah, this is where, this is where it can go bad. It's, it's good and bad because it's simple trust, simple obedience, unquestioning loyalty. Um, stage one Christianity means that God is the big person, in this case, the big person in the sky, who sets the rules, demands trust, requires obedience, and mandates punishments when rules are broken. I would say that if, you, if I was going to look to scripture, that that is a pretty accurate description of God throughout most of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's not a reflection of who God was, but it is a reflection of the, the time period of the, of the writers of, that, of, the, of those books, right? That that was the easy way that they understood how the world worked. So I've taught in some of the other Bible classes here that like when you read through the book of Kings, they will determine, and at the end of the life of a king, they'll say, this king followed in the ways of God, or this king was, was uh, not follow, I can't think of the right word. So this king was uh, punished by God, basically based on how long they lived. Because if they lived a long time, that must have meant God blessed them. And if they had a really short reign for some reason, oh, they must have been doing some real bad stuff. And so that's a good sign that God was smiting them, right? But it was just a way to organize the chaos of the world. Um, the key here is that uh, certain certainty that we are good people and that all those who are not part of our in-group are bad people, and that we will uh, that we will in the end have a happy ending, and those other people will not. All right, this is Baptist 101. Yeah. Get saved, or and, and come with us to the good place, or don't, and go to the bad place. Um. So that simplicity any any big questions about that i feel like this is this is recognizable because everybody gets this growing up like this, this is not a hard stage to get i don't know if this is stage one or not people who i think they they talk like they're god and they when they say things uh, on many different topics they, they, they talk as if they're God, and they have the only right answer, the right way to go. I don't know if this is in stage one or not, but yeah, that you can't they question it. They yeah. impose their what they judge. They judge and they impose their standards on everybody. Yes, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because it not only happens with people a stage one leader of a stage two church, for instance, but it's also going to happen across stages. So let me, let, let, I'm going to go a little further with that in just one second. So, so stage one is, it works until it doesn't. So that's going to be true for stage one and uh, really stage one and three, that it works until it doesn't. The transition from two to three is different. But uh, another quote is that doubt, it turns out, is the passageway from each stage to the next. This is from Brian McLaren. Um, without doubt, there can be growth within a stage. So it's not like you're stagnant within a stage, but you can grow within a stage, but you cannot move from one stage to another. But that's, that requires doubt, re doubting the assumptions of the stage that you're in. 
So something about sort of the house of cards that, that constructs the stage you're in has to fall apart and then you're gonna have to rebuild, right? So for stage one, this, uh, here's a pretty typical story that he tells in the book. So he says from the age of two to 12 or so, stage one works pretty well for most people. But as we mature into adolescence, we naturally desire more independence uh, and we begin to chafe against stage one rigidity. We may begin to question some of the rules that the big people have imposed on us since our childhood. Our social circles usually widen and we discover that some of those people out there are every bit as nice as us and maybe even nicer. And we'll begin to see some of the dualistic judgments of our big people were actually prejudices instead, right? With more age and independence, we read new books, we make new friends, we travel to new places, and we start to see that there are other people with their own, there are other groups that have their own big people who have their own set of differing beliefs and their own set of rules, and still more questions begin to arise. Up until this point, stage one may have felt like a school to help us learn the basic morals necessary for independence, but now it starts to feel like a detention or a cage or a prison. The only way out is doubt. I love that because it rhymes. The only way out is doubt. We may begin, uh, we may doubt that the authorities are always right. We may doubt that all the rules are always absolute and appropriate. We may doubt that they, whoever the they is, are as bad or as dangerous as our authority figures have warned us. Or we may doubt that we are as good and exceptional as we were told that we were. Add that, add to that the hormones and puberty and sexual curiosity and changing bodies that, and brains that happen in adolescence and simplicity stops feeling simple anymore. Whether it happens at 12 or 22 50 or 55, eventually many of us doubt our way out of simplicity and enter into complexity. So uh, uh, complexity is mainly in his book, something that most people will transition into in their adolescence. Um, I would say for a lot of adolescents today, that's college adolescence, right? We talk about adolescence now lasting to like 25 or so. Um, uh, getting out of the house and beginning to do that. Some of that comes when you're in the house too. But, um, so stage one, if that was all about dualism and dependence and authoritarianism, stage two is all about <laughs> pragmatism and independence. Now, pragmatism may not be a word we all know. So pragmatism is just uh, a fancy word for saying like what works for me, right? So, and that goes, you can see how that goes hand in hand with independence. That I start to say, um, here's a really good uh, breaking down of simplicity that a lot of us go through in church if we grew up in a conservative church where they told us that you had the only way to heaven was through Jesus. And we said, well, what about the people in the middle of Africa who've never heard of Jesus? Right. That's, pragmat that's, that's pragmatism coming into place. We have practical, real world, real questions that begin to eat away at the simplicity that we've been told. Say what? I said I always got it simple. Oh, you did? Yeah. But, well, if they, have, if they don't know about Jesus, they're not held accountable. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's the people who have heard and decided not to listen. Those are Right. <laughs> Great made up answer that's nowhere in scripture, but it was a but it was yeah. but it was a way to preserve simplicity. Right. Exactly. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. As is um forbidding education. Yes. Yeah, I was literally warned by my church when I went off to college. Now don't go off there and get any of those radical liberal liberal ideas. Yeah. Don't go all woo-woo no, on us, was what they said. Right. Don't go all woo. -woo. They would they would roll over tonight if they were here. Um, so um, you're, here you have a, a desire to self differentiate, right? This is very you, it's just filled with adolescent energy, right? Um, it's also that you have a new challenge to say, what do I want and how do I get it, essentially, right? Um, in stage two, we see life as a game of a that is a matter of skill a contest of competing and winning. 
uh, or better yet, maybe a complex set of a bunch of different games all being played at the same time, and we have to master the rules of all the different games. A perfect example of this was, uh, was today in the office. Christine was talking to me about her granddaughter, who is interested in playing volleyball, but she's terrible at it. And so they signed her up to do some volleyball lessons and she was really getting better, but she was getting frustrated because she wasn't, she still wasn't excelling like everyone. She wasn't winning at the game. And in this stage, what we want to be able to do is put ourselves in positions where we can win, right? So if we look at this uh, through the lens of a, uh, a high schooler, right? So to get a sense of the complex games a high schooler is gonna be playing. So um, in academic subjects, will I fail or succeed in math, language, history, science, art, each having a different game with a different set of rules requiring different skills, right? Just think about that. Just the studies alone that you're having to try to master all at once. And then which game should I specialize in because those are the ones that I'm most likely to win, right? So, oh, I'm really good at math. I'm going to go into engineering because then I can win, right? Then among your peers, will I be popular or unpopular, respected or bullied? How will I win the game of social status and, and popularity? How will I handle peer pressure? How will I uh, position myself to be able to find uh, sort of where I can land? Am I going to be in the nerd group? Am I going to be in the jock group? Where am I going to be in the social order of everything? A whole other set of games. With our parents, will they allow me to grow up and help me grow up, give me some freedom, or will they fear all the changes that they see in me and clamp down instead? How will I win in the game of freedom to be my own independent me? Then in our bodies, how will I negotiate the rapid changes that I feel, some of which are simultaneously powerful and exciting and also terrifying, right? How will I grapple with my adult body that all of a sudden is bigger in all these ways? It's, it's heavier, it's taller, it's like all these awkward bodies. There's hair places hair didn't used to be. <laughs> Skin and acne and breakout, all that stuff that's happening. And, and do all of that, especially in light of all the internalized messages I've got about how I should look and what beauty is. How will I manage my sexual desires and all of that? Ooh, that was good for a lot of us, right? How am I going to fare in relationships? What are all these weird feelings I'm having toward boys instead of girls? All the things that we were feeling about that. Will I win at the game of dating? And what does winning even mean in this context, right? Does that mean getting laid as a high schooler? Like, what does winning look like, right? And then uh, spiritually, how do I integrate all this complex information I'm beginning to learn in high school or college? about science and history and philosophy and psychology with the simple dualisms of right and wrong and, and us versus them and truth versus error that I was taught all through my childhood. So how do I relate to a God that's supposed to be so simple of just a system of do right, get rewarded in a world that's becoming increasingly complicated. And what I, what I really might need now is a God who's a, more of a coach an encourager. You begin to see how all those things are pushing you out of simplicity, right? That's the whole point, is that something is going to enter into your life that's going to shake it up enough to push you to a new stage. Oh, I'm thinking about the freedom of clenching in. Okay, I've raised two children, and it doesn't matter what age, but they want freedom. But then they want they want you to help them and do things that some days they'll say, I want to do this myself. Then that's another situation. They want you they want you to do it for them. A, a friend of mine has a, had a 55 year old daughter who didn't take the vaccine for COVID and she went into the hospital and said the people got COVID, they tortured her. And the mother, who was her age, helped her, this 55-year-old daughter, and said, she, she took the vaccine, and she, her comment was, you're treating me like a child. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> in the huh? in the mm -hmm. Right, but then, so 
Right. So, I mean, who knows with these people what stage they're in, but they we can revert, right? And that I think that with with all this stuff with masks and vaccines, we saw a lot of reversion to like not doing the basic, simple good, right? Um, there's a I, I can even in our own church, I can trace with our people and the variety of responses every one of these stages, which we may look at without trying to name names or anything, but you can see how every type of response to mask wearing is in these stages, right? Because if the, even just the two that we have, we have the, the big people told us the rules, do what the CDC says, do what the president says, do what, you know, the who, what the who says, and you have the, nobody can tell me what to do. Right. I've looked at the research, I read it on Facebook, it's fine. <laughs> That is stage two. I've read it and I've made my own decision for me. And it's pragmatic and it's independent. And do not tell me otherwise. Right? It's adolescent, <laughs> but it's there. Um, uh, to, to, to sort of talk a little bit more about what you were just saying, John, is that... Um, that cl that clamp down or let them grow that's a good way to look at it, what stage the parents are in a parent who responds to a, a freedom seeking child with clamp down is clearly a parent who is in authoritarian stage one right right yeah <laughs> but there's a difference between right knowing your kid enough to know that that's what they need and only knowing that that's the only that that's the only response you know how to have is to is that my job is to be an authoritarian, right? Because a person in stage two or beyond that has a kid who's seeking that independence is going to uh, is going to entertain the conversation about that in a much more um, evolved fashion of talking with them about what does that look like to still be safe and how do we negotiate that. Um, he says in the book that, that that's going to be a parent who's going to, uh, instead of uh, uh, sort of mourning what's happening to their kid, like a stage one might, that they're going to more celebrate the fact that their kid is becoming their peer, right? And enjoy this ability to have adult conversation with their own kid in a way they've never been able to before, right? Very different type of response based on the stage the parent's in. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that part where you contain them all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he taught he it's not one, two, three, four. That's right. It's not no. just as simple as one, two, three, four, but you're gonna you can't lose what you've got. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about okay. this in more detail as we once we get them all four out there for you. Um, but he talks about the fact that there's lots of different ways that when you look at all these different um, types of stage based theories that you can lay them on top of each other and they all still kind of agree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let, let's uh, so let me let me get through the rest of complexity. So uh, stage two is everything learnable and doable. Does that make sense? Because this is the the stage where you want that that practical information. So we're going to begin to develop new mentors, probably, because we're going to reject some big people, but we're also going to find some new big people that we fit, right? These are going to be teachers and coaches and other people in our lives that really make an impact. We'll talk about them for years afterwards because they're so important to us in this stage. They're going to teach us how to win in different areas or to at least not lose so bad. I love that part. <laughs> Because some of us just can't win, but we can lose less bad. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, when, when you in stage two Christianity, it's built on learning and studying and thinking for yourself. So this is that part where um, you're going to love the pastor who's sort of like that kind of coach, right? This is uh, everything to do with family Christian bookstore and the opportunity to go in at any time and find a new book on the six new steps for you to have success in Christian dating, 
for the six new steps for you to find success in being a Christian leader in the workplace or whatever it is, they're going to constantly churn out more and more material for you to play the stage two game of winning at whatever it is you're trying to win at now, right? Maybe you want to win at journaling. I got a book for that too, <laughs> right? Maybe you want to win at fasting. There's three books about that. that are, you know, this, this is the Christian industry, right? Because the bulk of Christianity is in stage two. This is the money-making stage. This is every sermon series. Uh, this is new songs and music. It, it's in every part of who we are as Christians. It's often really exciting because you're learning new things and that can be exciting to do. Uh, I'm just showing examples of all these things. Uh, learning, uh, I can remember doing classes on learning to witness and share your faith as a kid or a young adult. Uh, this is all your retreats and mission trips and all that sort of thing. We do these here too, right? So again, none of this is bad. It's just how we, how these stages show up in the Christian system. So um, let me, I have a couple more slides about stage one and two, and then I wanna take a break, talk for a second, and then we're gonna do three and four because there's sort of a big dividing line between those. So uh, crossing from stage one to stage two um, is sort of a critical uh, moment. So if we look at the that process and we begin to see the biases for the first time by one stage group toward another, because we're going to judge each other across these lines without even knowing it. So uh, a stage two judgment toward stage one, right? So I, I we, we've evolved, but we're not evolved past judgment. So uh, this is a story from a, an individual in the book. As a teenager, my hormone-infused body created a loop. The stronger my sexual desires, the stronger my shame. The stronger my shame, the stronger my need then to go to the church and get forgiveness and grace. The stronger my need for grace and forgiveness, the more I needed to read the Bible and pray and go to Bible studies and church services and youth group. And when I ponder this sex shame spirituality cycle, I can't help but look at stage one religion as a kind of forgiveness racket, a mafia that increases our shame and then is ready to sell us more forgiveness and then increase our shame and sell us more forgiveness and increase our shame and sell more forgiveness on some sort of ledger where we will never break even. So while that may resonate with some of our experience, it also sort of shows the way in which one stage can begin to really um, chafe against another. And that's the point of what I want you to get is that with that experience of going through a doubt cycle and changing to something new, we are going to inherently then have um, either judgment or trauma or whatever about what was before. It's, it's just part of that experience, right? It doesn't mean though that we won't at times go, man, I kind of missed when there was just an answer for everything. When life was simple. When life was simple, <laughs> yeah. That's part of it because, because that simplicity is still in us and we remember how nice that was. Right, so that's why you can't, you don't shed one, you just add another. Um, if we look the other way around of a stage one or judging a stage two or uh, here's a quote that uh, one, one stage one faith community told me I had to choose between the facts of science or the facts of the Bible. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking I probably would not be able to stay Christian as an adult since my authority figures also taught me that stage one Christianity was the only legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. So that's McLaren talking about himself. Um, McLaren, before he was a pastor and all that, he was a marine biologist. And so science was his love. And so he talks a lot about, in some of the, this book and, and even others, about how one of his first sort of doubt chafing came around science and religion, right? Um, 
So this is McLaren's stage two story of his transition. He says, um, I was thoroughly in, I was a thoroughly engaged stage two Christian by the age of 20. And for nearly 20 years after that, stage two worked perfectly well for me. So stage two is typically long. Of course, I had misgivings, and sometimes the complexity felt so overwhelming that I wondered if the whole complex system of beliefs and practices that I was constructing would collapse under its own weight. But most annoying, these stupid stage one Christians kept popping up in stage two settings with all of their narrow-mindedness and dogmatism and naive ignorance and their unselfish arrogance, and they drove me nuts because they just knew all the right answers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this kind of, the danger here is that this kind of comparison with stage one Christians can lead stage twoers to think they've arrived. And so for a lot of folks, uh, they think that stage two is the end, right? I've made it because now I know what it was and I've come out of it. So uh, there can be a sense that there's nothing after it which is dangerous. Um, so options at the end of stage one and two. So when people run into a problem with stage one or two Christianity, they've got a couple of choices, the lateral transfer. So the lateral transfer is a stage one Catholic has that system begin to fall apart for them. And so they become stage one Pentecostal instead, yeah. right? We keep all that authoritarianism, all the dualism, but we just move into a new system that has a different set of those things. So it feels new to us. We don't chafe against it so much because we've gone from that rigidity of a high church system to a, a different kind of rigidity of a evangelical or a low church tradition. And we don't notice that all we did was trade one for another. Oh, you did that? Really? From Catholic to something, or what did you do? Yeah. Catholic to evangelical, yep. And we, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. We all do these things, right? Yeah. Um, so lateral transfers, you can do a forward transfer, which is that a stage one Catholic might become a stage two Methodist or a stage two Buddhist. So that in the process of the system collapsing, you move to a new thing, but you also you also add the ring at the same time, right? Um, so that you you do begin to see what's going on in a different way. And then the last option is the regressive transfer. And this is not super common with these stages. It's gonna be real common in a second. But for some stage tours, they may temporarily at the at, as they try as they're at the end of their stage two like fall back into stage one instead of going on because they don't feel like there's an option to go on. And he says that in many cases, these folks will be, will, will um, almost uh, go heavy on stage one and go to cult-like actions and behaviors and groups. Hypervigilant, Hyper almost doubling that because they've been here before, so they can't be here the way they were again. So they're here in a crazy intense level. So when they they hit that that stress and that doubt yep. at stage two, and they've already bought into the concept that there's nothing else. That's right. Well, if this was supposed to be it, and it's not it, I'm experiencing doubt. Then that one's the good one. Yep. I was I was wrong to leave it to begin right. with. Yeah. All the people who told me not to leave were right. right. Like I mean, there's an easy narrative there. Life was so much simpler. Life was so much simpler then. Yep. Yeah. And Kevin and I had a whole conversation about how intelligence has nothing to do with this, because some of this has a lot to do with how you look at faith, right? You may be a really brilliant scientist, but you want a simple faith, right? You spend all day in the complexity of the universe, and you just want a faith that says, this is the answer, right? Um there can be all sorts of different reasons why we'd be at different places. It has nothing to do with any other characteristic about a person. We talk a lot of times about ambiguity. The chance for Trump ambiguity in your life. Yeah, it's not easy to live with I don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't like it in any circle. We don't want to go to a doctor and have them run a bunch of tests and say, well, 
your leg's falling off, but we're not sure why. Like that's not, not an acceptable answer, right? Like, but faith is full of that. Faith is full of that. All right. Um, so we've said some of this because some of you actually said it yourselves. But stage one Christianity dies with for many with the ad, with uh, the doubts of adolescence. Stage two Christianity can persist well into adulthood and work for many people for a long, long time, some people for their entire lives. Uh, for many, these these are the only two known versions of Christianity, either authoritarian, dualistic faith of stage one, or pragmatic, independent faith that's built on constant learning of the stage two complexity. But there is more. So... Before we get to more, do you feel like you've grasped one and two? Uh, yeah. Do you feel like you can identify some people that you know or stages in your life that you can go, oh yeah, I know what that looks like. Yeah. How about folks online? Melanie, that are you are you uh feeling like you got that? Yep, Diana, are you good? Yes, very I good. Just, I just now see that your hand is raised. I'm so sorry. I didn't notice that you did that earlier. My hand is raised? It looks like that's, uh, oh. I think that's what that is on the screen. I don't know. Okay. I'm not as comfortable with Zoom. with Zoom as I am Microsoft Teams. So oh, okay, great. as long as you're not, as long as you don't have a question, that's great. You two, you all online can feel free to chime in at any time because the whole room can hear you just fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, not only, I grew up in the United Kingdom. Uh -huh. And, uh, Level one to me is completely foreign. That makes sense. You would probably have grown up in, I mean, you would have gotten some level one as a kid, just being taught, you know, basic, like how to, yeah. But you, you, that you would have been raised by people who were not in that stage. And so you wouldn't have experienced the pressure of the stage one folks in your life. Uh, an author who shares that experience but writes about the same things is the other class that Lauren's teaching, Freeing Jesus. Yeah. So Diana Butler Bass is that author. She and Brian go to all the same conferences and do all the same things, but the, the difference between them as authors is that Diana Butler Bass never was an evangelical. And so she has your experience of having never lived through stage one Christianity. Wow. And so she does see things a little differently because she grew up mainline Methodist. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Christine is another one that I think of who she does not, she would not, she would not identify with that first part, but she's, she would get the rest of this, right? She knows it because she's seen it, but she never lived it. And it causes her to have a very different take on faith because she never got the authoritarian version. Yeah. Yeah. Just a fear of being manipulation. Yes, it absolutely he talks about that in the book, actually, that he he began to recognize where so much of it was about manipulating people. Yeah. You know, one or two. Yeah. Well, really, I think two is yeah. so. I mean, because when I think of two, I think of all the huge super churches and, and retreats just, that are designed to make you have a big, like, spiritual. Right. Yeah, um, you have this big experience all the time. You always feel like you're being. You know, you're being fed. You're being fed. Yeah, you gotta come get fed, right? Yeah. And the preacher always has a new book and talk in, you yep. know, and, and you know, there's all yeah, all of that. It's just it's yeah. manipulation. Yeah, what a, what a, what a stage two pastor, or maybe they could be beyond that, but a stage two congregant leaving a church can often say, and I've had people say to me is, um, I'm just not getting fed here anymore. Mm -hmm. Right, that could that could be a lateral transfer happening. Could be that they're in a stage that's beyond what the church is. Mm -hmm. Right, that the, the church can't do it for them anymore because they're beyond it. But it also could be that there's not enough, and they're running from the the doubts and questions that are coming in. Right, so I better bail and go get a bunch of new ideas from somewhere else so that I can quiet all that noise back there. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yep. Church hopping is. Uh, yeah. Church hopping is actually a part of stage two. He talks about that in the book that in stage two, you're not going to be loyal. Loyalty is stage one, right? That's the person who, I, like everybody at CCC, UCC, right? 
They're going to be here till the day they die because of the, the high level of loyalty they have to their church, right? Stage two, the folks are there. It's about me and personal growth. So I'm going to hop around searching for it, right? Because I'm desperate to find it. Mm -hmm. I may not even fully understand what I'm looking for, but I'm going to keep looking, right? The past thing for me is the obviously my family, but Southern Baptist, I still in that stage one and will always be there during the world events. Mm -hmm. And it caused a lot of tension as I started moving to other stages of my Christianity. Oh. Especially when I started dating and I was dating an atheist. That just it, there was a tension so it's unbelievable. How yeah. could you possibly even believe in God if you if you're dating somebody, you know, you're experiencing the lot all of that happened. Yep. Um, this is all the inability to, to have dialogue in our world right now, is that people that are in late stages can really have difficulty talking to people in early stages. I know some of you are big fans of Richard Rohr, those of you with Catholic backgrounds. Richard Rohr is the Catholic in this conversation. You got Diana Butler Bass is the mainline, Richard Rohr is the Catholic, Brian's the evangelical. They're all writing on the same topics. Mm -hmm. And Richard Rohr has stages and he only has two. And so his, his boils down one and two into a category and three and four into a category and so um if you're in if you're if, if you're you know from the catholic background that really helps you more read um richard's uh universal christ uh would be a good one it's basically this book not with the same questions but the same message from a catholic perspective i was raised catholic in in a very small town uh -huh. everybody went to church. we went to some church like sure. 99 percent of people went to some church and we had fun there yeah um so two thousand people there went to church on every corner that's fun well i went to a party a swim party i went to a catholic school and the, one of the kids in the neighborhood went to the public school and so she invited me to her birthday party at the swimming pool and i went and one of the guys comes up to me and says i don't know you who are you i said oh i'm lisa harden i go to st Anne's, and he said Oh, he said, are you Jewish? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, I thought you were a Jew. And so I go home. I was probably seventh, sixth, seventh grade. I go home and tell my parents about it. And I tell my dad that. And he says, who asked you that question? I said, Toby Brown. He said, his parents, Ron and Judy, and I said, yeah, I think so. He got on the phone that night, called his parents, and Toby, they, he insisted that Toby come and apologize to me Whoa. for calling me a Jew. Uh -huh. That is something. And I think about that now as one of the memories that sticks out, because I think, yeah. why was that so bad? Yeah. Really. But to my dad, you know, Jesus wasn't a oh. Jew. Jesus was happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. According to you know what I grew up with, Jesus was Christian, and the only way to be Christian was to be Catholic. But that's the only we were all you know, we were the, right. the corner of the church. I mean, Jesus said it. Right. Yeah. And nobody else was going to be to heaven except Catholics. Yeah, I was gonna say most of us thought we were the only ones. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I can't, you know, I tell my dad how I feel about him. Of course, I'm being a But to this day, I don't like the word Jew. Wow, because it was such a such a shocking experience. Jewish, mm -hmm. but I don't like the term Jew. Oh, ah, yeah. Are you a Jew? Yeah. Are you a Jew? Are you Jewish? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. But to say to someone, are you a Jew to me is like a negative. Mm -hmm. Like I would never say to someone. Wow. I'm going to say, are you Jewish? Are you doing a tradition? But I would never say to someone. Also, I think because back then, you know, politically and historically correct, you had to Jew someone down. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it had a negative connotation as well from that. Yeah. I'm just amazed now with why we have to be so Yeah. And Toby and I eventually became really good friends in high school. <laughs> that's some of the, that's a that's a good example of that us and theming though, right? Mm -hmm. That that you got you got put into the them category 
and that was not okay, right? You crossed over. Yeah, I got it. It's preparing. It's yep. it that is absolutely a stage one thing. Don't do not think that we're in the wrong group. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I feel like nothing. So where do I stand? Yeah. Okay. I gotta keep it. I gotta keep us moving because I have thirty minutes and we have two more stages. Okay. So. Um, expressing or even entertaining doubt sometimes makes so much takes so much courage that we may t say it takes real faith to doubt. That's Lloyd Jeering. And then those who believe in God, but without passion in the heart, without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even at times without despair, believe only in the idea of God and not God's truest self. That one's deep. You have to think about that one for a minute. So story time. Here's an example of entry into stage three. Uh, this is Brian talking again. He says, I met Walt at a gathering for people concerned about environmental issues in my uh, state. When he learned that I was a pastor, he did what many people did. He explained why he didn't go to church <laughs> as if I expected him to have an excuse. <laughs> my wife and I used to be Catholic, he said. Then we got born again, and then we got spirit-filled and joined the assembly of God. But we found out they had a whole lot of rules, like no drinking alcohol, so we switched to Presbyterian. <laughs> we enjoyed being Presbyterian for a while, but then my wife got into an argument with the pastor because she didn't like how he interpreted the Bible, so she became a Methodist for a while. But then she had problems with that pastor, too, because the minister performed secret weddings for gay people, so now she's something called an independent charismatic. And I said, so you're still Presbyterian then, trying to keep track of, track of all these switches. And he said, no, I felt like our religion bus was taking too many sharp turns. So I pulled the cord and got out, got off after Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, I guess I, I stopped seeing the point. I studied some Buddhism with a teacher at the community college. And now mindfully walking these trails has become my church. It's a little lonely, but it's better than singing songs and reciting creeds that I don't believe anymore. I guess out here on these trails, I just walk out all my unanswered questions. Mm. And so uh, you hear in that a piece of stage three where no matter what changing happens, it stops, even that stops working, right? So stage three is per perplexity. And so uh, the key about this, this transition to stage three is that it, it takes a real crisis. And I've underlined the word crisis because this is different. The degree of, of intensity has to turn up more for this change to happen, to force a forward transfer out of stage two. Um, for many people, when a stage two religious program or teaching doesn't produce results for them, a, 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 sinc a sincere stage tour will just simply amp up the effort and keep stage twoing just harder, right? They, they may even assume that the problem is with them, right? Michelle, you kind of said that, mm -hmm. that you blamed yourself, right? But eventually their confidence will crack like in like a breach in the hull of a ship. The, the outside of all the doubt is going to pour in, right? And that's where crisis comes. Um, so yeah, the stage two project will, um, will start to fall apart. So um, stage twoers may, at that point, then go down with the ship because they don't know what's beyond it. And so they'll just crash and burn. And in another example of stage warfare, Stage two leaders often poison the well of their followers by telling stage two followers that stage three communities are just liberal and evil, and it would be just better to not be Christian at all. Right? This is how a lot of those evangelical churches will talk about mainline and beyond, right? This is what they say about us here at MCC. Oh, that's just gay people playing church, right? Or what they say about liberal or progressive Christianity, but that, oh, that's not real Christianity. They don't even believe that in Jesus. Like that, that's Christian, uh, 
UCC as Unitarians considering Christ. <laughs> right? That they're not real Christians. Um, so from this perspective, when stage two Christianity fails you, you only have two choices. We talked about this a little bit before, which is that you can go back to stage one or Christianity just fails, period. That's it. The end. Lots of people in the gay community who no longer go to church had a crisis that was forced by their sexuality that brought them out of stage one and into stage two. And then in the stage two game, there was no way. And so the whole thing just collapsed. And they didn't know that there was another stage. They just left the enterprise, right? They're the people who, if they actually came here, would go, oh, I've never seen this kind of Christianity. I actually like this, right? And they do when they show up here. Mm -hmm. um, so we have two roads, the stage two nuns. So if you read much out there, you're going to find uh, some of the work talking about nuns and duns. So the nuns are those who reply to the questionnaire of what, what kind of faith do you have with none, right? They know what church you go to, none. Uh, they no longer identify as Christian, or they have, uh, they're likely not identifying in any other faith tradition either. Um, they may still believe in God, or they may not. And they're going to still be pragmatic, because they're still in stage two. So um, they're going to still focus on what works for me. It's a little bit like Walt, where he's out there walking those trails, but a little lost about where to go. Um, the duns are those who just say they're done with organized religion, and they'll often say I'm spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. Nuns and duns are kind of hard to tell apart. Um, then you'll have stage three perplexity. So life for folks in stage three uh, is, is more than simple and more than complex. It is downright perplexing. So this is going beyond complexity to perplexity. Reality is stranger than we can imagine looks deceive, full truths are far less convenient and ha than, ha than half-truths and lies, and they are confident that people are con artists making profit at other people's expense. There you go. I did a little bit of talking like that, too, talking about all those people selling those books and all right, that, yeah. right? So the spirit of stage three in one quote from a famous preacher's son, he doesn't tell us who it is, but think Charles Stanley's son or somebody like that, says, I wish that everyone at their baptism could be presented with a state-of-the-art bullshit detector because they are really going to need it in church. <laughs> because I have seen through and behind the veil, right? And so... I know that that stage two step is just a game. And so you better have a good BS detector. So here's a stage three example of somebody full on going into it. This is also, by the way, really close to my own story. Joelle's first class on her first day of seminary was a church history course. She was shocked to discover that the doctrines she'd assumed had always been held by all Christians everywhere actually took shape through controversy, dispute, and even violence over the centuries. The next day, she started a Bible survey class. And again, she was shocked to learn that the process of assembling the biblical texts was long and messy and far less confidence-inspiring than she had always been taught. For a seminary class on worship in her second week, the professor had the students read several articles defending and critiquing various understandings of the meaning of the Eucharist, of the Lord's Supper, communion, all of them centering on the phrase, for your sins, Jesus died for your sins, that's found in both the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians. She had never once even wondered what for your sins meant, because it always just seemed obvious to her. <laughs> but after that class, she was genuinely perplexed. In her Christian ethics course, later in the second week, she, the class read and discussed sermons from the pre-Civil War period that defended slavery using the Bible. She never knew such sermons existed, and to make matters worse, she was disturbed by how similar they sounded both in the style of their communication and in uh, uh, the method of interpretation of, this, of Scripture 
to the, the sermon she was hearing in church and on the radio. She began seminary excited about studying theology and the Bible and church ministry in more detail, but by her third work week, she had felt like she'd made a terrible mistake. She said, uh, she said, forget becoming a minister. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a Christian anymore or even believe in God. One question kept echoing in my mind. Why didn't anyone ever tell me this before? Why did all the sermons and books and conferences and podcasts and other teachings I devoured never even mention these things? Were they just ignorant or were they intentionally trying to distract me with various spiritual shiny objects so I wouldn't discover this, the disturbing truth of our own history and faith? So that's crisis, right? She, the whole thing, what you're, what you're needing to get from her story is that a, a few cards got pulled and she was able to see the whole thing collapses when you do it, right? That everything I've been told is wrong. Now, I want to tell an important piece of this, uh, which is that stage three churches self-destruct. And it's important because MCC has a lot of stage threeers because we, our lives necessarily push us through crisis and often push a lot of people in the LGBT community all the way into stage three. We get a fast track that those that, those that don't have some of the adversity that we have uh, get on. Same is true for uh, racial minorities. Any, any minority group is gonna get on a fast track to move through these because we're gonna have to see through the systems that pretend to be for us but aren't, right? So that BS detector in us gets turned up higher than for other people. And so things to watch out for in our own church, this is why the board is gonna be required to watch this lesson, by the way. Uh, we destruct and we self-destruct in five different ways. Number one is structure. Because we distrust and challenge even uh, uh, to stress and challenge even our own institutions constantly, perhaps obsessively. If a stage three person builds a structure, they will be they will be compelled to tear down the structure they built, and to find all of its flaws, because that's their BS detector in overdrive. Whatever stage three people construct, they will feel a, a block. They will feel they must immediately deconstruct it. Uh, they will there they, these churches fail because of authority because for stage three authority figures must be approached with a de facto suspicion it's hard for any leader leader to ever earn the trust of people in perplexity and even harder for them to keep it over time stage three groups tend to use exhaust and then discard their leaders purpose because stage three individuals specialize in critique and destruction, not only goals, uh, not goal setting and action. So we, we, we specialize in critique and destruction, but not goal setting and action. They gravitate towards groups that focus on conversation and analysis rather than mobilization and mission. That seems counterintuitive, I know. Can you say so, that again? Yeah, so in, because I'll, I'll simplify the sentence. So because they're so focused on critique and destruction and deconstruction, sorry, critique and deconstruction, they gravitate towards groups that focus on conversation and analysis instead of mission and mobilization. Because we wanna sit and churn and think and talk and deconstruct and tear it apart and never get to saying, let's do this. Because we can always find the reason to say, well, yeah, but. Right. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. It's analysis paralysis. Analysis yeah. paralysis is what you know, in, in a, that, that is a great um, sort of more corporate way to talk about it. Um, when a person frustrated with stage three years will say, if I hear one more yes, but, mm -hmm. right? Can we just do something already? And stage two cannot tolerate this, right? Because stage two is going to be focused on do, do, do. Learn, learn, learn. Go, go, go. We don't, they're not going to allow themselves to get stuck in this mind. Um, one note that I have about this is that um, while many stage three people are drawn to social justice, this is McLaren talking, not me, um, much of that action 
has a deconstructive and oppositional feel to it, right? That we're 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 against something. We're against something, but we couldn't quite tell you what we're for because everything that we can think to be for, we can find the problem in. So it's it, it's characterized then by resistance that requires only short-term intense involvement. So I'm going to do some marches, or I'm going to boycott something. I'm going to rant on Twitter or Facebook, but I'm not going to ever actually join anything in a serious way to make change. Right. So the, the next problem then becomes belonging because to belong to a group wholeheartedly can too easily mean buying into its limited perspectives and blindnesses. So I can't tolerate being a part of something because I can't help but tear it apart, right? You can see why this would be toxic to too many people in a church that are in stage three. So for that reason, stage three folks feel more comfortable on the fringes of a group rather than belonging squarely in its center and even better, they might try to be a fringe part of a lot of different groups that are all doing things that they like, but they're not going to really join and, and, and become heavily involved with any of them. But they'll love all the different viewpoints that they could find by being a part of a lot of different groups. And then the last uh, one of these is suspicion. So stage three individuals generally operate on, on the hermeneutic of suspicion. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a biblical term. We, we talk about a lot in queer theology, actually, that you approach a text with a hermeneutic of suspicion. So you're interpreting it with a suspicious attitude. That's basically what it means. So I'm going to go into every situation with a suspicious attitude. What are you really up to? Right? So they're keenly aware of organizational and institutional injustice, how pervasive it is, how it connects to oppression and hypocrisy. So they enter every new organizational setting expecting the worst. And those suspicions will almost always be confirmed because guess what? That's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. And we're all human. There are always going to be problems in every human institution. And so if you come looking for the problems, you'll find them. And so it can get you really stuck then because then you're proving to yourself over and over that this hermeneutic that I'm practicing is the right one because I keep finding problems. Yeah, Ron. Yeah. I mean, this, this, is MC, this isn't this church. This is MCC Global. People have left this congregation for the year. Mm -hmm. UCC, same thing. Yeah. This this is progressive Christianity, because to to leave and get forced out of the other stuff by your own life experiences or whatever, you're going to come in now with this that we I think this gets called religious trauma a lot, and, and but leave, it's not. It's the next phase, right? Leave, <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this, uh, is this related to? Yeah, I think that oversimplifies it, though. I don't want to say that because it, it, this is an important. It's related. Yeah, it's related to self fulfilling, but it's not about self fulfilling prophecy altogether because these things, none of this is wrong, right? All these things are reality. You're beginning, you, you, it's like you've been given some of those um, x ray glasses that they used to sell, right? That you, you see through it all now. And you're not wrong in what you see through. But you're, you um, aren't able then to actually con congeal that into anything to go forward. This is a little bit that place, that, that first quote of you can't dwell in doubt forever, right? But you really are tempted to here, to just absolutely have the worst view of the world, of humanity, right? This, the, 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 this negativism, this is everywhere right now online that I've always got the worst possible take on everything about how the world is just shitty, about how the president's terrible. It doesn't matter who it is, like everything's shitty because I can see through it and just tell you how it's all bad. It, yeah. It's not wrong because we need this too. This is also what pushes systemic change mm -hmm. and addresses oppression. But it's dangerous. It's a dangerous time. Dangerous if you believe that that's all there is. That's right. If you yeah, if to stay here nothing, forever yeah. is dangerous. Yeah. Maybe that's a cynicism, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cynicism, apathy, 
that's that's where you land if you get stuck here. I don't trust you. Yep. So, um, this is one of my favorite sentences from the book. He says, of course, if stage three people turn all this on themselves, they may become disillusioned with their disillusionment, (laughs) skeptical of their skepticism and suspicious of their own suspicion, which sometimes leads them to regress all the way back to stage one or stage two. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the way back. All the way back. Yep. Yeah. It also, I mean, I think it's um, it's part of communities too. I mean, look at our country. You know, I mean, so many things we talk about how the pendulum swings, right? But, yep. Yeah. And so, I mean, human nature. So this is critical because we land here. We're real. I mean, this is true crisis. You have, I have, I have more compassion for these folks than anything because I've been here, right, and um, been here more than once, and it's awful. It's truly awful, and um, you have it, it, it turns on a dime that you go back to one, you go back to two, or you can go forward to four, but you're not in. You're not in a lot of control of that. A lot of it's going to have to be about circumstance. So we talk about the descent and descent of stage three, right? So descent is all that challenge that we're doing. Descent is sort of spiraling downward because that's what it's, that's what it feels like is that you're just spiraling into a never ending hole, right? 2020 is like for everybody, a little bit of stage three in the world. Um, if, sta- if in stage one, we ascended to the heights and became masters of simplicity, we had all the right answers. In stage two, we trekked up rugged trails of independence and steep slopes of performance toward the summit of spiritual progress and success. We thought we were just really arrived. And then stage three, even though it brings new gains, feels like loss of everything that we worked to, to attain. It just feels like the whole thing's just been for nothing. Some of you have been there, Stan. Yep. Yep. Why even bother? Yep. Why even bother? That is so much it. That that temptation toward apathy and just just walk away. Again, so many in the LGBTQ community. I'm just done. Right. That's that other option. Remember, either to move forward or to be done. Stage three feels very distinctly different from everything else that we're going to talk about tonight. Nothing feels like this. Yeah. Yeah. That if I, yeah, that you could have it since that I'm just done altogether. I don't even like living doesn't even matter. Yep. Lack of hope. Yep. So this one is so different because it's so disruptive. The transition from one to two doesn't compare in terms of the disruptive nature of it because there's too much excitement about the new that you're learning in that process, right? It's That can be really disruptive to people around you, like the parents and, fa- and family that don't like what you're learning and doing. But to you, it doesn't feel bad at all. It feels exciting. Um, this is disruptive and it's born out of crisis. All right, so some examples of some stage three challenges, okay? So we're gonna use an example here of just the six lines of moral reasoning. So when we talk about morally why we should or should not do anything, you've got six reasons to do that. Justice, compassion, purity, loyalty, authority, and liberty, right? We're not gonna go deeply into that, just know that there's the six reasons. Every argument can be brought back to one of those. So we use all six of those to base opinions on and conservatives often feel morally superior because they seek to emphasize all six of those. On the other side of that, progressives tend to focus only on two, justice and compassion. Think about the the conversations between Republicans and Democrats Think about the conversations between Baptists and MCCers, and you'll see that coming true over and over. That the biggest priorities in our church have to do with everyone feeling loved and with doing good in the world. That's compassion and justice. But if you go to a Baptist church, we're going to have a bunch of concerns about how you're living, right? Uh, we're going to get rid of that alcohol. We're going to make sure you're not like looking at porn. We're going to we have all kinds of sermons on all kinds of topics you're never going to hear at MCC because we're going to hit on all these other topics that we're not talking about here. 
more progressives have reached stage three. It's just a, a, a natural part of it. And because they have come to doubt authority figures and institutions, they have deconstructed many arguments based on purity, loyalty, authority, and liberty that are often used and marshaled against justice and compassion. I know that doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense yet, but let me give you some examples. <clears throat> so genocide. Perpetrators of genocide use moral logic of purity to render their targets as impure, dirty, savage, subhuman, right? Pick a word. And so that means that this genocide is okay because this is about purity. Yep, they're ungodly, whatever, whatever it is. That's why we can do the crusades. That's why Hitler can say that we need to exterminate the Jews. I mean, that, that is, it's about purity, right? That's gonna rub stage three years all wrong. We're gonna be highly suspect of anything that's based on purity because we know how that gets marshaled against justice and compassion. Every racist or bigot has used loyalty to the racial, religious, political, or nationalistic in-group to justify harming or oppressing the out-group, right? That they're a, they are a threat to who we are. This is everything about how we talk about, um, it's in the news just this morning I saw about the um, uh, immigration from Mexico. They are a threat to who we are. So if you want to be loyal to America, you better be against those, uh, any kind of uh, revision to um, immigration law. Yeah. And then personal liberty. Every one of us has used the object, the, used the logic of liberty at some point or another to absolve ourselves of responsibility for the common good. So maximizing liberty for me, that I need to be able to do what I want and what I need to do at the expense of liberty for you or them. Right? Uh, let's, uh, masks are a great example of this. I'm healthy. And as long as you're wearing a mask, you're fine. So if you're not healthy, put a mask on and I, but don't ask me to, right? That's maximizing my personal liberty over someone else's. Now that takes really ugly forms, which is why those arguments don't tend to fly as well with a stage three person, because we've seen those types of arguments used against us probably, right? Um, so, uh, um, marriage, gay marriage. Um, there's one where personal liberty w was challenged by the by the um, the moral folks, and so we are suspect of arguments about that. Um, ironically, when progressives that are often in stage three downplay four of the six lines of moral reasoning which we tend to do because we focus on justice and compassion, that makes us seem less moral to the very people that we're often trying to convince to come join our side of things. And so we're losing those arguments over and over because we're continuing to understand the motivation of the person that we're talking to, assuming that the two things that motivate us are the things that motivate them when it's not. We might wish that people in stage three could integrate uh, the arguments from purity, loyalty, authority, and liberty and service of justice and compassion because you can do those things. But being sensitive to that level of nuance in stage three is not typically something you're capable of because in that stage, you're in the burn it down place. And so you're not gonna have a sensitivity to understand how, how could we do this differently? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get to stage four to do an integrated um, model. Everybody still with me? Because this is getting this gets this gets more and more perplexing as we go along. <laughs> so stage one: dualism and dependence. Stage two: pragmatism and independence. Stage three: critical of everything and everything is relative. Right. So relativism. And, and I am absolutely, uh, that's that hermeneutic of suspicion. However you want to write that, 
for yourself as a, as a mental note. Every critical of absolutely everything, and uh, hopefully, eventually, yourself. It's one of the only ways out. Um, the goal in stage three is to get to the truth, no matter the cost. And that second part of that sentence is really important to distinguish it from other stages because other people are going to want the truth, but stage three years don't care what we have to do to get there, right? Um, uh, a good, I feel like um, uh, defund the police is an idea that for a lot of folks is just like, that's, that's a bridge too far for me to get on board and want to help with. But this is that that that's a great stage three. I don't care the cost; it's so broken. Let's burn it all down and build something new, and just defund the whole thing, right? That's a great example of a stage three perplexity response uh, to the to the race the systemic race problems with policing. The new challenge of this stage is what is what is the hidden agenda agenda or bias that I need to be suspicious of, and then challenge, right? What's what's really going on? Let me put on my x-ray glasses and figure that out. In stage three, we're likely to see life as a joke, a quest, or a deception. So the joke part, Tim, is kind of what you were saying before, is this is all just stupid. Mm -hmm. And I can start to just be above it all, right, and laugh at the rest of you, right? Mm -hmm. It can be really, what's the word for that when you have that kind of attitude towards everyone else? Condescending. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Very yeah. condescending, yeah. Arrogant, but not a, yeah, not in the way that an authoritarian is arrogant of having all the answers, but but a different, more condescending to their, towards the rest of the world because you see through it and everybody else can. Um, a deception is that part where you just think everything's a lie, right? You see through it, nothing nothing really matters. So in the descent, and, and remember, we could put either version of that word there, descent or descent. Uh, it's interchangeable in the stage. In the descent of stage three, it does not help to be told that eventually a resurrection will come. I said that from the pulpit this Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. That in a worst place, mm -hmm. stage three that I was talking about on Sunday in my doubt, in that worst place, it does not help to be told that there will be something new because in the tunnel, you just cannot see that yet. And you can be stuck in stage three for a really long time because it does have payoffs. That this is what keeps you here is finding those uh, those those things that are wrong that you keep looking for and finding. And you go, oh, see, I'm doing good in the world because I continue to uncover all these places that need me to uncover their problems. So I bet they didn't even know how many problems they had till I came along. <laughs> Condescending. A little bit. It's interesting that that little uh, part of that last statement about, you know, the direct resurrection, you know, there's a resurrection coming. It's interesting because that is exactly the line that we tell our, um, our queer youth. It gets better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we wonder why it's not working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, I, I'm, I'm, too, I'm probably teaching with a little bit too much attitude about all these stages, but the, these are important parts. We have to go through them, the, the, and they're all in us all. Mm -hmm. So none of this is bad. It's just part of the journey of being human, and you can't really skip it. Um, you can't force yourself into a stage three, right? I think this class, this book could push you into it. If you read the first 10 chapters, it could probably push you into one because it could be just like that seminary class going, Floop, there's the whole floor out from underneath you, right? Which is why I was terrified to teach this class. Um, <laughs> I don't want to do that to anybody because stage three sucks. I don't want to put somebody there. Um, so for Jesus, a focus on justice and compassion were ultimately two facets of one thing, which is love. So this is getting to the end of stage three. You've done all that deconstructing work and over and over and you're beginning to sort of um, move past it. Um, perplexity is deconstructive, but it is not destructive. Okay, so it's, it is inherently necessary to do that deconstructing work, but it, it's actually still in the person who's working it, it's going somewhere. That's the part that's not destructive about it. It's, it's a constructive stage of descent on its way toward love. That's straight out of the book. 
If stage three dissenters keep descending through perplexity, they will reach a moment of crisis. So this is the critical part. So you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this for however long you do it. And you're eventually going to reach a point. Will your magical superpowers, I've been talking those x-ray glasses, however you want to think about it. Will that become your Midas touch of like perfection, right? You know, the Midas touch that you're great at things. Or will it undo you? Will it just ruin you? So your two options at the end is that you will see through and determine every that every uh, see through everything and determine that there is nothing left to see, no value. It's just all for nothing. This is the meaningless despair, apathy, all those words that we were talking about before. You can land there, right? Your other option is that you you're seeing through all the BS that you've been that you learned to see through using that skeptical doubt, and that can lead you to a seeing into a new thing. A more mystical and contemplative kind of insight begins to come to you, where you see something you never could see before. And so when you're able to do that, if you're able to do that, a deeper, more coherent narrative of sort of harmony begins to take shape. I think stage four is the hardest one for me to like tell you about, but I can tell you a story about it. Um, before we get to that though, the parting insight of stage three is that faith was about love all along. We just didn't realize it and it took doubt to help us see it. I believe this is what you hear Lauren and I preaching, the stage four type message of love is really the central thing, right? It's why we're a church that says, we believe in Jesus, but he's not the only way. Right? All that is opened up here. Not to say that uh, we're all there. A little of a longer quote, this is by Diana Butler Bass, who's the book that um, the other class is reading on Tuesday nights, but this is a different book called Grounded. And so she says, they are not crazy. They are part of this spiritual revolution, people discovering God in the world and a world that is holy, a reality that enfolds what we used to call heaven and earth into one. So this is stage four that she's talking about. These people are not secular, even though their main concern is the world. They are not particularly religious in the old fashioned sense, even though they are deeply aware of God. They are fashioning a new way of faith between conventional theism, conventional belief in God or a higher power, and any kind of secularism devoid of the divine. The future of faith would be an entirely earthly spirituality, a brilliant awareness of the spirit that vivifies the world. This is in the uh, conversation I had a couple of Sundays back when I talked about heaven. This is the part for me that part of what I had to go through was going, getting to a place where it was okay if this is it. Sounds very good. Sound, yep. And the, and the part where this is it is the, the focus on an, an, an completely earthly spirituality that we sort of let go of the... Um, the fantastical parts of spirituality and ground it instead. Again, the same name of this book is Grounded, right? Okay. There's a, um, a spiritual teacher that I have listened to over the years, and a lot of their stuff is based on the Course in Miracles. Oh, yeah. And she talks constantly about a spiritual awakening is happening. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual awakening happening, right? And it's all about that whole, like, you know, an earthly spirituality. Yep. rather than something mystical or somewhere else or some other time that's here right now. Yes. <clears throat> what Brian McLaren, Diana Butler Bass, Richard Roy, they all say that that spiritual awakening is happening and they all feel like we're actually doing this right now. Mm -hmm. That we have a spiritual awakening happening and they are trying to get more people on board with this because they see a simultaneous yes. degradation that's yeah. happening mm -hmm. That's that the worst of five years ago, the worst of today wasn't thinkable five years ago, and that there's nothing to suggest that the worst of five years from now won't be unthinkable to us today. Right. And that that for all of us, it may be a critical time 
where we will either pull enough people up to this way and go somewhere new or the whole thing's gonna come crashing down. That we will have a societal stage three because societies live in stages two. All right, so stage four harmony. Uh, this can be known as second simplicity. In fact, he almost named it that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more right before we're done. I'm sorry I'm running a few minutes over, but we are on the last one. I need you to know all this before the, we start. Uh, the key components of stage four harmony are these, integration, inclusion, and transcendence. I think we know what those are. I'm gonna keep moving. So integration, inclusion, transcendence, it sounds a bit like MCC and the things that we put in our vision statements. A stage four example. So here's your story. Pay good attention to this because story is the best way to describe stage four. This is McLaren telling the story again. He says, I took a long walk on the beach near my home the other day and was accompanied by an old friend I hadn't seen in over a decade. His religious upbringing was similar to mine, conservative and evangelical. Rob described how he felt his path had led him out of our childhood faith into a long, long stretch of doubt. So a really long stage three. He left one belief after another along that uphill, tr uphill trail, like extra weight in a backpack. His loss of easy answers and inherited comforts felt terrifying one moment and liberating in the next. Rob said the process continues for him. His notion of God today is a far cry from the bearded white almighty sitting on a throne controlling everything as he pictured in childhood. These days, he's also rethinking his inherited beliefs about death and the afterlife, pondering his own mortality and the mortality of the whole human race, whether through a human-induced suicidal catastrophe in the short term or through some more cosmic termination of millions or billions of years from now in a big freeze or a big explosion of the sun. He said, it's strange, but to the degree I stare into that abyss, and accept the inevitability that I will someday die and the possibility that humanity will eventually go extinct and our little human DNA story will be over forever. To the degree that I face that without trying to, to suppress it or candy coat it with some beliefs or fix it with some dogma, something happens in me. I stop trying to explain away all the pain in the universe and all the pain in my life. I stop having some ironclad explanation for everything and admit that I just don't know. I feel less and less like I'm trying to play God and have all the answers. And I feel more and more like the tiny human being that I actually am. He told me that this experience of surrendering to the not knowing felt like death and resurrection. He said, the more I face the stunning fragility of life, and the tiny scope of what I can actually figure out, the more I find myself looking around and thinking, wow, I am still alive now. And that strikes me as a pretty wonderful thing, a gift and a wonder and a miracle even. It's like waking up after a catastrophe and realizing that you lost everything, but you're still alive. And then you realize that when you had everything, you didn't feel half as alive as you do now. Then Rob, Rob raised his hands and turned around there on the beach, remember, and said, I get to enjoy this, to witness the sand strewn area with shells, these waves and the white surf and the pelicans plunging into the water, this breeze, the clouds towering above us with a good friend standing beside me. And then he closed his eyes and took a deep breath and inhaled and exhaled and said, right now, and now, and still now. We started walking again, silent except for the crunch, crunch, crunch rhythm of our feet on the sand and crushed shell. And then Rob mused, I used to think that if I didn't have any, all the answers, I would only be left with questions. But now, I'm starting to realize that if I live into the questions, if I don't have to fix or solve every problem, then I can welcome all the unknowns with wonder and innocence. 
and I don't know what to call it, a kind of meditative awareness maybe, or even reverence. I keep finding gratitude and wonder and joy and this feeling of companionship and freedom. I'm less sure of what God is and more sure that whatever God is, God is with me in all of this. A few moments later, he added this. That's not such a bad thing, living in a world of wonders rather than a world of answers. It's actually very, very good. Living can be good. So if you can sort of distill from that, which was probably a distillation of several people because Brian is combining people anyway, that's the best description of stage four that I have for you tonight of what harmony looks like. Here for stage four folks, beliefs are less important than values and faith. So I'm really less interested in arguing about like the meaning of baptism or some of these other things that other churches might spend whole nights arguing just one of those questions in a Bible class. I don't freaking care <laughs> in stage four because the answer to that's not the point to me anymore. Right. Stage four folks are looking for connections between all of life and openness to the mystery of oneness that is out there. Like, how is all this really connected? How am I part of all of it? Right. I think of that the James Webb telescope pictures like that, the, just the awe of that. Like that's yeah. all wrapped up in this. It's like, how am I connected to that? They're asking themselves, what role can I play in bringing about the common good in the world? but not asking themselves, like, how do I do that from a distinctively Christian point of view, right? I just want to bring the common good to the world. They're gracious and understanding deeply that all of us are fallible human beings that are doing the best we can. And that is the significant difference between where I was in stage three and where I am in stage four, is that I am humble here because I turned all that scrutiny on myself, saw all of my own failings, saw how, how all that racism and misogyny and all that other shit that I was pointing out in other people is in me too. And so I am much more gracious, deeply humble and understanding towards myself and towards others. All right, and now if you think you just got it, the big wrench of the whole thing is that stage four isn't the end either. There's Even though it's a four stage system because after you're in harmony for a while, harmony becomes your, I know, I know. So harmony becomes your new simplicity. Remember it's simplicity two. And so if you live long enough, you're gonna surely then end up in another complexity, which will lead you to a new season of perplexity and so on like rings of a tree. So you're never, once you get here, your simplicity is gonna be different than once. You're never gonna go back to authoritarianism, but you're gonna have, there is a simplicity of saying it's all about love, mm -hmm. right? right? It's yeah. really simple. Right. And you're gonna land there and it's gonna be okay. And then some other piece of it's gonna come in and all of a sudden you're gonna start going again with a new type, a new like shade to the problem, right? And so it then becomes a constant series of growth. In my life, I talked about on Sunday that I've identified two real perplexities of coming out and of the real shit doubt situation I had last year, sorry, I didn't say shit. It was awful. And so like I've never been that deep in that hole except for those two times in my life, right? I maybe had some little perplexities, but never those deep, deep ones, right? And I try to keep perplexity as the, I, I try to keep a real difference between complexity, which is just the normal stuff and perplexity, which is full on crisis, right? Where the whole thing's gonna collapse, right? Um, Brian says it feels terribly depressing to folks who are just breaking through into harmony to, and feel so relieved to leave perplexity behind to now know that you're going to have to go back there again. <laughs> um, 
but after you cycle through those stages a few times, he says you begin to, to feel that dualism, pragmatism, relativism, and holism that are skills at your disposal. So you start to learn how to use them when you need them, right? That you know the situation where, oh, this is a dualism situation or a relativism, so like you start to, they're, they're tools in your toolbox eventually, but you're gonna need to make some passes through to get that sort of uh, expertise. He says, have a few runs to the spiral, you become less conscious of being in one stage because you remember they're all in you all the time, your rings of a tree. So it's all inside you. So you might start to have a little less clarity when you're in harmony three, what, whether you're in harmony three sub, sub complexity or not, because you're in all of it too much now. Uh, but you're able to then access all the strengths. And then the bad part is you're then also able to fall for all the temptations and weaknesses of all those as well, because that's also in you, right? So when you're under stress, you may fall for some old temptations and weaknesses that are in some of those rings that you've got. And it says, just imagine yourself with a tree with 60 or seven rings inside your bark. And you can see that for such a tree, autumn and winter would have stopped to being a surprise a long time ago. So, oh yeah, complexity again, you hardly even notice, right? You have all the stages, sometimes things come to the surface, certain stage Yep. That's it. Now we're 20 minutes over, which I regret and I'm sorry for. I was trying, I was so worried and I tried to go fast enough. I did not go fast enough, but this is critical. I know some of you want to go home and go to bed. You absolutely can do that. I'm also here to, for discussion because I just downloaded a whole book and a lot of information. And for me, at least in reading it, a, a way to just sort of go, wow, like I can see everything and everyone in my life in a different way now. I can see my job in a whole different way and, the, and have some compassion for some folks in my job in a different way. Um, so uh, I don't know what you, you need, you need to decide what you need right now. I'm gonna keep going because I wanna do a couple more things with it. If you're watching at home, you can also quit now. If you're watching this on a recording, I'm gonna keep it going because uh, I, I wanna do what I talked about before and go through this with masks. No, not Siri with masks. Um, but please don't feel nobody's getting up and I feel like you don't feel like you can you absolutely can get up and go home Wes so, I, I am going to sign off Okay, um, thanks, I, I need to get my meds I've, I've been in this position for just a little too long tonight and not okay. that I wasn't interested and no. um, perplexed and uh, <laughs> <laughs> all all of it and i wish i could really stay on but i can't that's we we will be praying for you absolutely thank you love so. everybody love you too bye. Bye. okay are we doing discussion now or are you going on with things else? both if you have a question do it i do yeah um, and you may or may not want to do this i don't know um my mind is spinning going back to your summer the last year mm -hmm. Thinking about the depth that you dealt with at the same time you were on sabbatical mm -hmm. and being in your family and dealing with all of that and, and watching where they were in their stages and looking at where you were in your stages. And I think about the trigger. I wonder if you can talk about what triggered you, if you even more than one trigger, into that process that, that took you down and brought you up. That, can, can you get on with what I asked you this time? Yeah. It's relevant because we're going to work on it. Yeah, is it hot in here to anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you just hit the, the button? I think it must have reverted to its schedule, and I am sweating up here. So. Oh, yeah. Please turn it down. I thought it was just, uh, I don't care, 74, 72, 60. I don't care. Uh, yeah, I was like, I, it, it, sometimes when I'm up speaking, I get hot, so I don't know if it's just me. Um, so it's that's a hard question for me, Ron, for two reasons. 
number one, because it's scary to answer that question. Uh, and number two, because it's not one thing. Um, I think that it began with the report of concern against me. So for those of you who haven't been around, in 2016, a member of this church filed a report of concern that I had um, sexually abused them, which was not true, but it was absolutely awful. And in some ways, we've never recovered from it as in my relationship with this church. In other ways, we've moved on. But I never recovered from what it did to my faith in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, it changed my relationship to the church forever, to this church and to the denomination and to organize institutional Christianity. Um, I felt absolutely betrayed by a church that said that it practiced an, a spiritual, an open spirituality that understood queerness when it was absolutely the epitome of queerness. And um, so th something really broke. That was the whole breakage. Um, but then once the hull broke, everything else started to break, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think the next four years were me trying to not pay attention to the water I was taking in, if I can even keep the ship metaphor. Um, and I felt a lot of, this was, this was very wrapped up in my job because I felt a lot of pressure through all of that to be okay and to, I'm still the leader of this organization and I have to move forward and carry us. And my own struggle has to be my own struggle because you don't want to hear this from the pulpit. You don't all agree with how I see it. You, you've been told other things that are like, like so much I can't undo, right? Um, but in the background of all that, I was crumbling. And I didn't really tell anybody that. Um, Lily and Katie knew some. Um, Kevin knew everything. My therapist knew, you know. But here, like, I didn't open up to the board because I didn't feel like here was safe. If anything, I had been taught here was the opposite of that. Right. Yeah. And then I felt like if I if I showed that kind of weakness now, it would just be capitalized upon as yet more more evidence of how I'm unfit. So as that continued, um, what started to shake for me was um, Uh, the whole institution part. So that meant I started to look at how the church came to form and uh, I saw that this is just the game that was put in place by all those disciples who were left to put a game together. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you this is what I believe. I'm telling you this is... This is the right. road. This is the perplexity. Right. Um, and so then it got to where uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, that resurrection gambit, that's a really great one. Because then I've got you by the, by the horns. Because if you want to live forever and if you want to go to heaven, well, then I'm in total control of you. And... Um, so resurrection fell for me and never had before in my life. And um, where I would sometimes struggle and walk into Lily or Katie's office, um, it's not, Lauren's too late. That's why I'm, I'm not saying her name for no reason. Like it's, she's too late. By the time she got here, I'm too far. But um, 
uh, I need to preach um, Christmas Eve or Easter because it's my job. It, it, I can't give one of those big Sundays to them. But I don't believe any of it. And so how do I say what I know everyone needs me to say and not feel like an absolute fraud? And I spent a lot of time feeling like a fraud in that time. And I didn't have the space to unpack any of the, for all these years, I was so ready for it before COVID and I was about to go on sabbatical and then COVID hit. And so then I waited another 18 months. And I think that was the most destructive for me because I thought I was about to have the time and then didn't, right? right? And then I needed to hunker down and do something even harder than we'd ever done before. And I was already a mess. And so that's, I struggled when I came back from sabbatical because I wasn't done. Right. And so people kept saying, oh, well, tell us about your sabbatical experience. What did you learn? And I'm like, I wasn't ready to share it because I was still in it. I think that I didn't, I didn't emerge out of that until the last several months. It took, I, it was a year. I, once I went down, it was a year. Yeah, I mean, I think that the risks that I'm taking now are where you can see it the easiest, like getting up and talking about having a sermon this past Sunday. I wasn't ready to let my guard down enough for that. And I'm in a place where I'm willing to trust you all. And if you fire me this time, fine. Right? Yeah. Right. And if, and if, uh, when we were going through the real rough patch with masks earlier this year and people started to attack me personally and say, oh, you clearly don't care about people and how can you be a pastor and not mandate masks because you're risking Bill Hurst's life. I was like, if we want to go down this road again, I'm out because I will not be, I will not take it again, you know. Um, and so I changed a little bit in there as well, found myself again a little bit. Um, I can say, personally, speaking only for me, my love for you, I have to say. Well, it's not, to, yeah. You're going to have to hear this. But the reason that's important is that's, that's a story that you can lean on. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you have to talk. It doesn't mean you have to do anything. You can have the comfort. And security of knowing that, that I am doing, and other people are going to say that for themselves. Well, and that's not what I want because I don't want to be a stage one leader. No, no, no. right. So I don't. But that was what. But this is an important part of it for me, Ron. That I didn't. I never. That was never the problem. Right. It wasn't about whether people had my back because I always knew that. The offer, there was the chance to get rid of me always, right? So the church was choosing to stay just as I was choosing to stay, that we were trying all of us to go through this together, right? Because any one of us could have called it quits, right? Me easier than anybody. Sure. Um, but it was about, um, it was more about the, the fact that, the, that that breach let everything else in. It was more about that because eventually I realized that the people who were still here trusted me, right? They may not have loved what they learned or whatever along the way, but they, they weren't just here to hate me, right? Some are here because of loyalty, especially if they're like stage one, right? They're here because this is, this is their place and they'll just wait till I'm gone. Fine. That's true in every church. There's always people who are just waiting for you to be gone. Right. <laughs> I got used to that a long time ago. But I don't, I think, I, I think I want to pivot because I don't want to make this all about my experience. And I know that not everybody would tell the narrative of all that the same, but that's, that's, I, I, this is the first time I've ever told my narrative to anybody in this, in this church because I don't feel like my narrative of that experience is what's important. Um, it's mine. Wasn't just singularly that experience either. There were so many things that 
Yeah. Right. And with every new thing that happened, because I wasn't, I was already in, I couldn't, it just put me further in. Yeah. Yeah. Which is normal. That happens in life. He even, one of the things Brian talks about that is an insight he gained is the, uh, the metaphor of, uh, of, of think of a person standing in a stream and the water swishing around your ankles the way that it does and it sort of swirls and almost flows backwards on the other the downstream side it almost comes back and goes the other way and he said i used to think about life where um where i was the thing standing and all the change was swirling by and I realized that what was actually happening was that the change was the constant and we are the things that are swirling by. People, time, all of it, that's what's swirling by. What's what's constant and steady is change. And so sometimes we get too much of it at once. Yeah. But we still tend to, to tell the narratives around ourselves and the that we're, we're what's still in time is passing by us and so the other one around. Yeah. Uh, other questions where I, I can do the COVID thing that I was going to do. Yeah. Or comments. I don't need to answer questions. Just com comments, discussion. My personal perspective about you know, the journey that you just shared is that I feel like it's really sad that you don't feel like or you haven't felt like that there is room for you to be. And I know that some of that comes with being a leader, right? right. That pressure that you put on yourself to be a leader. Yeah. At the same time, this is your darn church too, right? And you should be able to feel just as loved, just as accepted, just as human and flawed as any of us have the right to be. Sure. Well, and if you want to see how this is relevant to me, Appendix 3, do I stay in my denomination? If you just notice that, uh, I, thought I, I thought I highlighted more on this. I looked at the wrong one. Oh yeah, a letter to pastors, Appendix 4. Mm -hmm. I, I basically said, oh yeah, this whole section, that whole paragraph, that whole paragraph, like the whole, <laughs> this whole basically this, this whole thing, because it's, um, uh, he does acknowledge the way in which you you put a pressure on yourself as a pastor. So if you want to lens into Lily and Katie and me and Lauren and the struggle that we've all gone through, because all four of us have done this, um, you can read that. I don't care though. I don't, my goal in this class is not for you to understand it from my perspective, but it is challenging to be in a stage, a largely stage three church. And to be a person going into stage four and deconstructing church yourself, where do you go when that's your like job, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And that's that's the hell I've been in. Um, so if we look at masks again, leave anytime. I'm leaving in fifteen minutes myself. But um, <laughs> uh, um if we look at masks in our church, in our church, so I don't want to look at masks in the broad world. I want to look at it in our church. And we had a big crisis here in the early part of this year that some of you know happened and some of you don't know, because some of you didn't pay attention or care because you were just like, whatever the church says is fine. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're doing our best. Um, so uh, stage one, obviously. They say, they say to wear the mask, we wear the mask. Right? We talked about that already, right? We believe authority figures, we follow it. Stage two, which we have a good number of in our church as well, because that's a big chunk of the population. It's the biggest group in the population, stage two. That's all the folks who know better, right? It's almost the folks who know enough to be dangerous, right? Because <laughs> right? you're learning, 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 but usually not to a great depth, right? Mm -hmm. So you just know enough to be dangerous about a lot of different things very common right now so um thankfully here because we we uh skew higher than that in progressive church we don't have a ton of that here 
We have a little, but it's a minority voice in MCC, which is weird. In my parents' church, in the evangelical church, it's the, it's the majority voice. So in their church, they never were able to mandate masks because it wasn't even on the table. Because in, the, in a majority stage two church, no way. That looks like that old church we came from and there's only two types of church to begin with and we're not that and don't tell me what to do. It is absolutely, if, if you're a majority stage two church, you probably never had a mandate. Well, I feel like you just said very well. And you just said, again, it's a good leadership role there and it's important that input from all the board and input from helping to move them up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm very proud of our board. Absolutely. Yes. I think that our board has done an amazing job. But we are high stage three. So what do stage three people do? Right. Even if we built it ourselves. So that means a stage three person, which we had in our church agreed with the institution we built which was we're not we're going to wear masks right or we're going to wear masks when there's certain levels right this this low medium high but we can't help ourselves so even though we agreed with it what are we going to do we're going to tear the thing down because guess what i can think of three reasons right now why that's not a good idea yeah Oh yeah, but it doesn't mean we don't storm over this. Okay? That's that's the point I'm trying to make is that, that this is where stage three storms. If you know, like if norm, norming storm, we're gonna we're gonna fight now, and um, we literally had folks that were saying um, I, this system can't exist, and then we say, okay, what's the new system? Well, I don't know, but did, that's not a good right. enough system, exactly. right? But because it exists, it, <laughs> and that. that and, and again, compassion for the, for this because that's stage three perplexity. I am perplexed by the by what is happening in this world, and I can see the problems, but I can't see the solution. And I'm also unwilling to allow for enough fallibility to go with any version of good enough. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, I'm not proud of how I let some of that exhaust me a couple of times in that journey through that, because it is exhausting. Remember, part of stage three is that they use up burnout and spit out leaders, right? And I had a little bit of that happen this time. And, and, I, and um, I hadn't read this text yet to be able to, to understand what I was dealing with and be more graceful, right? Because I think if I had had this four stages, I would have gone, I know what I'm dealing with. I just need to sit back, be patient, and understand I can't fix this, right? Mm -hmm. It's not fixable because any any fix I do will also just get torn down. Right. Right. Yes, and yes. Exactly. Yeah. I, I read everything Brian writes. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. I, oh yeah. I feel like I am. <laughs> I've, number one fan. I've met him and had a one-on-one -on, one -on -one conversation with him that is like the highlight of my life. But he probably wouldn't remember me. But I got to have a I got to have a one-on-one -on -one lunch with him at the last general conference that was in person, like six years ago now or whatever it was. No, three, four years ago now, and still like. I wish I just wish he had written these books before that discussion, <laughs> because the conversation I was trying to have with him was this conversation, but I didn't have words for it yet. You're probably in this, right? I could. <laughs> it's, it's very likely that I'm. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, because I was asking all those questions. Yeah. And it's interesting that the older person say it's from the look of that perspective. So you're, well, you, you're hoping. You know, Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. He even says in one place, I don't remember where, 
that this last, the book that we're reading, the last one he's written now, uh, several of his closest friends have said, I feel like this is the book you've been trying to write for the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that's absolutely true. When you look back, I mean, I, like I say, I've read all of it. It yeah. absolutely, this is, this is under it all, but he never, like, he never said it. Like, he finally now found the words and said it. Already writing? Huh? Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> yeah. You have a gift. That, that's that's part of the funny part too. People are like, oh, do you want to write a book on your sabbatical? I was like, I got nothing to say. <laughs> nothing. That's not where I was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's where a book starts. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have gone way over. I will not do this again in our future weeks because in our future weeks, we're going to be much more contained. We will end promptly by eight in the future. Thank you all for your interest. Thanks. And it excites me that you found this as interesting as I did. And uh, I look forward to where we go. Yeah. Yeah, and I kind of think you should have me and David before to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well,